And I would like to welcome our final panelists of the day to the stage and led by our wonderful moderator, Autumn McDonald. So before we begin, I wanted to just talk a little bit about why it's so important that we think about civic engagement and what it means to be part of kind of like the civil discourse and our civil rights and our civil rights connection to our just everyday rights, right? Like everything that we need, our basic, our fundamental needs as humans. And I want you to just kind of take a moment to think about like what that, that means to you before we jump in here. Because we're making the connection in this next conversation between public interest technology and civic engagement. And I don't want us to lose for a moment what that means when we think about civil rights, a fantastic civil rights leader, mm. uh, and not just the legacy, but again, the future of what's to come, what we will see, and what um, we will help make real. I want to start by making sure that we all kind of are uh, in touch with kind of who, who's here and who's in this conversation. Uh, and I want to ask each of our panelists to just take a moment to introduce yourselves. Uh, I know it's written and down there for you, but I'd love for us to just start with a brief introduction. So if you can just take a moment um, and then we'll jump into this conversation. Great. Good afternoon, my name is Lily Beth Genghis. I'm the Chief Tech Community Officer at the Caper Foundation. And for folks who may not be aware, what we do, we focus really on helping making the tech ecosystem more equitable um, and creating opportunities as we've shared of what does the future look like? How do we shape it? And for me, this work is extremely personal, mm. uh, both because of how tech has changed my life, my family's life, how what I was able to work on as an engineer what I decided to leave, why I had ethical decisions in a lot of these times, almost 20 years ago, to where I'm doing now, which is really how do we help use technology in a way that is actually helping close gaps of access, creating opportunity, creating choices that ultimately provide us those freedoms. And we are really at probably at one of the most challenging and turning points of our entire human generation mm -hmm. to date, because never have we had the opportunity of so much data lower cost of these technologies, and yet the majority of the population of the current state of the U.S. is not reflected mm. in who those creators are. So for me, it's personal, it's professional, it's also spiritual of, of being able to see how the genius that has been encoded in our DNA from many past generations and ancestors is really the moment that I think we, we need to reconnect with to be able to really decide what is the next real uh, innovation is going to look like and how does that impact us. So happy to be here and honored to be here as well. And um, as a Latina immigrant, there's a lot of unlearning and relearning that as well, that my community um, is it's participating and that we need to include them in, in this conversations as well. Fantastic. Thank you. Good afternoon as well. Um, Kevin Harris, I'm glad to be here. I'm our executive director of our cybersecurity clinics and our HBCU um, Cybersecurity Center at Steelman College in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And just having been fortunate to be exposed to technology early in my life, I think that's one of the things that has made me kind of be a champion in this area. But to make sure that I would say that exposure changes attitudes mm. so that the more that we can do to pre present these new fields, and we say that they're new, but to what you said is when we think about the civil rights movement, we think about hiding information um, from slavery, guideposts. When we use words today such as encryption and VPNs and routers, we think about that as being a new way to secure information. But really, we've been securing information critically for years. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. I mean, I don't know what to say after Dr. <laughs> dropped the mic, um, but simply to say, um, I guess the biographical narrative is simply, one day I was working at an HBCU in Nashville, Tennessee, and they were like, you young, but my dissertation was about 
gender, gender studies and about how school, girls achieve. And they said, you're young, teach our technology class. I was like, that has nothing to do with my dissertation, but I needed the money, so I did it. Um, but that was at the height, I'm just being honest, how, talk about pathways into this work. Yeah. Um, and it was at the height of the Arab summer. And, and at that time, co communities were organizing through their mobile devices to topple di dictatorial regimes. Hmm. And then that's how I actually got into the work because in the in black spaces, if you're young, you're gonna teach a technology, you're gonna be over media ministry. Just because of your youth, they empower you with technical skills. Mm -hmm. Y'all didn't catch that, okay. <laughs> Who caught it, caught it. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I can tell already, this is gonna be quite the conversation. And uh, I just wanted to just back up a moment and just share my own context, which is that I am with New America California, and uh, our focus has been, uh, for gosh, the last six, seven years, thinking about uh, economic equity and thinking specifically about resident voice, worker voice, and just what it means to influence the narrative, to influence policies such that people have the ability to thrive. And there's a lot of that that has to do with civic engagement, but a lot of that has to do with just all of us doing this whole thing in concert, right? Mm -hmm. Like all of us living in concert and what that means as the way that we live continues to evolve. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you could go back centuries and the way that we live is constantly moving in different ways. And what that means in terms of the tools that you need mm -hmm. uh, and the, the way you need to be conversant all of that is always changing. And so that's why it's so important to have this conversation that we are having now. Uh, I wanted to jump in and ask Lily our first question, <laughs> which is related to the people who are thinking so deeply right now about civil rights uh, have been going through a really important shift. And that shift has been more of a focus on digital rights. Mm. So can you talk to us for a moment about what are digital rights and how are they in some ways also civil? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what are some of the things that we should be uh, considering as we confront this in our lives? Yeah, definitely. I think if we look at the current space that we're in and the world that technology currently plays right in access to education, healthcare, employment, and even voting information as we were discussing last night. And when we think about how we got here and looking backwards um, to the point that Fallon made through her really beautiful uh, conversation speech today, it's like we have to understand the history mm -hmm. and specifically understanding the impact that redlining has mm -hmm. had and continues to have in the current infrastructure in how things, how different zip codes and neighborhoods are also being codified in this digital world, right? And so seeing the, how our everyday life has changed from brick and mortar to being more digital and the types of data points, the types of bias, the types of discrimination, and also the types of data privacy rights that we're losing, the mm. transparency rights that we're losing, the awareness. We're at a moment that we don't understand, many of us, especially in the communities that we're working with, may not be understanding or realizing that they're being discriminated in this digital mm -hmm. sphere. Mm -hmm. And one of the areas that we, specifically at the Caper Center that we worked on last year was partnering up with Consumer Reports to specifically help raise awareness of what are some of these ways that these algorithms are really impacting who gets the mortgage rate, right. who has the better healthcare access, as we saw during the pandemic, the data showed so clearly the disparities of equity in healthcare, mm. in basic access to education, to internet, to jobs, to safety. And I think being able to le leverage that moment of just really challenging times as we saw coming out of the pandemic, we must make sure that we don't lose the urgency of the moment that brought us together, even for an instant time and second, the, the world stopped, mm -hmm. right? And we all saw, wow, like no matter where, how rich you were or not, whether you had degrees or not, for that moment, the world stopped. And we also realized that without connectivity and access and digital literacy, a lot of the, the discrepancy of this redlining history was mapped and mirrored. In fact, actually here in, in, in Oakland, we, there was, we actually compared the data of the redlining maps mm. to the maps of digital 
uh, speed and internet connectivity. Mm. Mm. Uh -huh. And it was so blatant to see, mm -hmm. right? And that's how we started getting into the digital redlining conversation. Mm. Right. And so it takes us back to this question is really important because without understanding the civil rights that many, many um, people and leaders fought and, and died for, we have seen those rights be um, digitized and a lot of that opportunity for us to fight for our rights, making sure that they're not being violated, are becoming more and more uh, opaque. Mm. Mm. And this is why these spaces and conversations are super critical and why that's, uh, as an example, why that Consumer Reports three-part video series called badinput.org, you can check it out, was to really start that conversation, not with the technologists, not with the entrepreneurs, but with the community members, the folks right. who are on the ground working with a lot of the, the community that were disconnected, the folks who are also specifically out in East Oakland, um, mm. working in non-English communities, mm. right? Immigrant communities, communities that are living multifamily to one unit, mm -hmm. that even though these federal programs are coming to help them be connected, they still can't reap the benefits, but here they are paying their taxes and paying all mm -hmm. their, as they purchase and are living, they're contributing to, to the economy, but there is no way for, with, at the current level of infrastructure, for them to reap those benefits and have that access. And so I think the, part, the first part is really looking at how we're raising awareness. Mm -hmm. How do you know if you're being discriminated when right. all this data is being obfuscated? Mm -hmm. When all these companies say they can't say why or how these algorithms work, <laughs> but yet we have to, we have to push back. Right. The second part is helping us understand, well, how do we push back? What does the advocacy look like? Mm -hmm. What are the actions that we can take? And this is where I think for myself, uh, this work has been a schooling in itself because I came from engineering. <laughs> building different types of software and hardware and like learning about business, but being out in the community and seeing the faces of the kids, the families, being able to show like how some of these challenges are really palpable between whether they can make their rent or not. Mm -hmm. It's to me drives me every day, but being able to have them also understand how they can engage in the policy side through comments, through calls, through making sure that their experience is not being translated into words and high, you know, uh, policy initiatives, but that they are the ones helping share their stories and in their own words. Um, and then the third part is like, then we have to move to action, right? Which mm. is, we have to make sure that we're staying on top of it. And I think this is where, as consumers, as owners, as builders, we have to make sure that we are making, we are um, looking for alternative models and alternative solutions. But there's going to be trade-offs that we make. Yeah. So I think the time is important for that. And so and a lot of this stuff, and I'll get ready to close because I got a little long-winded, but I think a lot of this stuff is to remember that okay. our experiences are, are, have become data points, right? Mm. But we have to make sure that those data points are mm. not deciding what we want to build, use, apply. Mm. We want to make sure that that's where, especially right now at this current moment, looking at the rights, our data rights, our data privacy, is super critical to making sure that as we're thinking about what are these digital rights, yeah. we understand how that is, how our data is being leveraged and used with our knowledge or without our knowledge, yeah. with our buying or without, our, or without, right? And unfortunately, a lot of the, the business models of tech companies have taken advantage that we haven't had policies, laws to better protect us, especially yeah. as we get into the world of AI where it just becomes more obfuscated. Yeah. Mm. So we're all in this kind of sandwich generation right now, mm. so right, like we've, many of us are experiencing where our parents are getting a little bit older and then uh, we sometimes see things that make us wonder about how as time goes by, you'll see uh, the different technologies and the different scams and the like, which are, are, are putting more uh, people who are older at risk. I was at the post office the other day, and a man came in and said, you know, I need to get this package, but I was told that I have to come to the post office or I have to, you know, go to this website and so forth because they don't have the right information. And then as if I give them 30 cents, then I will be able to. And so the woman behind the, you know, the, um, at the post office was like, that's a scam, sir. Mm. And so he was like, no, 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 it's not a scam. Like, he was like, it's, it's definitely, I just have to put in my credit card and then I give 30 cents and then that's so give me, you know, give me my package. And she was like, we never ask for your credit card information. Right. Mm. And so I was just thinking about that and what that looks like 
over time and building the awareness, as you talked about, educating, figuring out how to advocate. And I'm using that as a very tiny example. But I think about all of the things that need to, and it's only a matter of time before my kids will need to be explaining me to me all the different <laughs> things that I need to be mindful of that right now, you know, I, I can't even imagine exactly what they are. But the thing that you said that I think is really interesting is that when we think about public interest technology, there was a time in the earlier days where it was kind of like, okay, thinking about maybe how legislators, the folks who are coming up with the policies and coming up with the laws, can be thinking about where does technology play into that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you're pointing out how important it is for every one of us, every person, to be really mindful, aware, educated, and able to advocate uh, as it pertains mm -hmm. to their engagement mm -hmm. in this, this kind of specific realm that it's really important for that to be connected. And then the other thing you said that I thought was really important is just that they're able to share the stories in their own words. And I think when we're changing the kind of narrative around any of these things, it's so important that we recognize that we can't change the narrative without changing the narrators. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. That's just that's so critical. Mm -hmm. Love that. Uh, um, I wanted to move on to ask you, can I call you Kevin? Should I call you Dr. Harris? Kevin's good. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, I would love if you would talk to us a little bit about um, the importance of cybersecurity and the con in the context specifically of civic engagement, what are we um, kind of specifically should we be thinking about in this highly digital world? Yeah, I think when I think about those conversations, currency comes to mind. Mm -hmm. You know, when we Think about, you know, as you mentioned, redlining. We're talking about property, or before that, you know, when we look at the bar system, or whether we're trading jewelry, or we're trading pottery, like that's important to the society, and that's what's needed, whether it's our paper currency or our mm. digital currency that we have. But now our currency is data, mm -hmm. it's our information, and it's information or currency that we can't get back. So unfortunately, if we're scammed um, and we lose all of the money in our bank account, we can get that back. You know, it may take us a while, you know, it's gonna be rough, but if we give up our data, which is our digital currency mm -hmm. that we have, we can never get it back, potentially, mm -hmm. especially when we start talking about biometrics or, mm -hmm. you know, really invasive um, pieces of our data that's personal. And so I think we have to frame it as not, information because a lot of times when we talk to people about information you know I hear people tell me oh I don't have anything to hide and I always say mm. you should have something to hide mm -hmm. even if it's just your banking information um, and so I think when we talk about currency if you know if we left our wallet or our purse somewhere you know we're immediately like okay where's it at how do I go get it but maybe we don't have that same urgency if we leave a external drive or a phone mm -hmm. or a laptop somewhere, or we leave our um, cloud um, platforms, password is one, two, three, four. Um, <laughs> you know, it's all that information is out there. So it shouldn't be one, two, three, four? <laughs> Just add five to it. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but I mean, I think that is the organizations that work social justice, environmental justice, climate justice, all of this is important. Mm -hmm. And that data that they have um, has to be protected. So I mean, I mm -hmm. think that's why cybersecurity is so critical um, to uh, what we're doing with social justice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Come on, Kevin. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I usually save this for the end of a session, but is there anything that he just said that makes you think you being uh, Fallon or Lily, is there anything else that makes you think, do you have like a follow-up question to like mm. bring up anything for you? Because I, I think that's an interesting thread to kind of pull on. I'm gonna let Lily do that. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> I, I think when we think about especially the biometric data, right, and we've seen um, how some of that information, especially talking about the mm -hmm. discrimination that are embedded in a lot of these algorithms, when when we think about the time of importance of policies and regulations, but also the responsibility that a lot of these companies have, right? Mm. So what would be, should I ask a question or? Yeah, no, oh, okay. feel free, yeah. 
So on that end, I think one of the parts that we're seeing is like there are some decisions where a lot of technology to help, maybe to help find our vacation, great. <laughs> to help find you know, the restaurant, great. But when it's a life and death type of decision, right, whether it's healthcare, safety, mm -hmm. wondering on, on that end, on what are some of the current things that folks can do on the cybersecurity side that mm -hmm. as everyday folks who understand that narrative, that, that, that mm -hmm. part where mm -hmm. this is a critical data point. I think be involved with the design of systems. So a lot of times security, cybersecurity is added after systems are designed. So the, you know, a lot of times if you look at application designers and developers, their main focus is on features and um, the operated, um, can, how does the platform operate? And so if you look at should we collect data, like some, mm -hmm. some of that should be asked from the very beginning, like is this something that we need to collect? Is that something that mm -hmm. we need to share out? And a lot of times it's easier to say, let's collect it, maybe we'll need it later, um, but really you're putting individuals, mm -hmm. companies, their lives um, at risk, and potentially like when you talk about healthcare with wearable, um, and implantable devices and sharing that information. And sometimes I think even consumers that might have a wearable medical device or an implantable um, device don't know the risk mm -hmm. because sometimes the medical facilities will say, oh, it's okay. And I think sometimes they'll even, you know, will say the likelihood of this device being attacked um, is low mm -hmm. because someone has to be within X amount of feet, 10 feet, 20 feet. So that makes, that should make us comfortable. Well, we're relatively close um, <laughs> here. So um, over extended amount of time. Right. So, I mean, these are things that we have to think of. And sometimes, you know, just making sure that, you know, people are aware of risk, I think is mm -hmm. um, our role in cybersecurity. Yeah. I guess I do have one additional question if we're. Yeah, please, um, please do. It makes me think about the translation for communities. And I know you're doing something with cybersecurity clinics. Can you talk a little bit mm, about yeah. that? Yeah, so one of the things that we, um, the consortium of cybersecurity clinics, and we have a clinic model at Stillman, is our students are going out working, and our clinic, the students are working with small minority-owned businesses mm -hmm. to provide no-cost training and awareness to them. And so sometimes, especially small businesses, they're so involved in providing their service, their product, and they may not be able to fund even a cybersecurity mm -hmm. training for their employees. Okay. So the clinic model provides these services for free, but it also is important because the students get that experience mm -hmm. before they graduate. Because in the tech field, as we know, that sometimes that first job, they want you to have you know, one to three years of experience, which is, you know, crazy to me that it's an entry level job, but they want one to three level years of experience mm -hmm. or five years of experience. And so how to get there. And so the students are able right. to get that experience. So thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're representing Stillman. Well, give it up for Dr. Henry. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you both for asking these wonderful <laughs> questions. And thank you so much uh, for having these wonderful answers to them, Kevin. Um, my question for any of you, now this is open, uh, is what role do you see public interest technology playing in the future of civic engagement? And to some extent, you've already talked a little bit about this, Kevin, but for, for any of you to add in, and what I want to say as a kind of specific distinguishing point is we could talk about public interest technology in impacting how the individual kind of protects their own kind of, lets their voice be heard in their own protection of their like well-being and their self-interest, their family, what have you. Mm -hmm. But when I think of civic engagement, I think of it beyond just kind of like me and mine. So it's not just like, what do I do to make sure that Autumn McDonald, I am safe and that my kids and my husband and my close friends and like, like my people. So what in your mind is specific to like how I engage in my community or how I think about Oakland or how I think about the state of California and how I am then engaged in what's in our best interest? What are some tools that I can use if I'm thinking about that connection between public interest technology? And it may not be me, I may not be the best example because I am not a technologist per se. 
but oh now listen did you not hear my whole speech? i know okay okay <laughs> and you me knew, specifically I'm because say, i oh am God, all like, i gave my heart and i soul think about, about justice uh-huh. <laughs> and no, what what I I I I push back on that slightly. Yeah, please. Um, number one, I you should never have to qualify your greatness because you are great irrespective. Let me just say that as a black woman, saying this to another me. black woman. Um, the second thing I will say, I mm, see Adrian and I have a lot of conversations, y'all, <laughs> and I am of the mindset, the definition of public interest technology. I don't know if we've yet canonized officially what it is and what it should be. Mm. And I know that there are a lot of conversations on what it is not. Um, I think I, so when you ask me a question, um, how does public interest technology affect civic engagement? I am at a moment of saying that for me, it is the same. I, I cannot extrapolate them from each other because technology is terraforming our lived and democratic systems. Mm. And so our response will be a public interest tech response. Mm -hmm. Mm. Does that make any sense? Absolutely. Um, and so <laughs> I, mm. I, I think about this a lot. It, it, the definition of how we think about this, the idea that you hosting a panel of thought leaders that you have to qualify yet again that I'm not a technical person in order to but yet you're doing the work of public interest technology mm. you're engaging in conversations about how data and how these iterative technologies are being used to take away freedom mm. and so I think for me to even answer your question eventually we as a discipline because that's what we're becoming we need to canonize a definition mm. and it cannot be the current one where it's dependent upon technical expertise mm. because you would take her off the stage and you would take me off the stage because I'm a political scientist by trade. <laughs> That's my professor y'all from Spell. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's my initial thought to it. Got it, got it. I think for, for me one of the concerns um, and I think that's such a perfect uh, capturing of the moment we're in, which it is that conversion, right, of what is the words have a meaning, especially in tech. As somebody who was technically trained as an right. engineering, all these, these are all just words mm. that, that when you think about this tech bro culture and environment and spaces, social construct, they're just words that after you, you basically you're like, okay, what does that really mean? Right. Mm -hmm. Then you're like, oh, okay, oh, we got it. We totally can be talking. So a lot of the times these, it's a very important time, especially in community engagement, to be able to making sure to meet the community where they're at. And we also have to make sure that we remove some of that jargon and just like talk as clear as we can. Because right. A lot of this stuff and these technologies, this is not the first moment of technology advancement mm. we've been going through. We've been going through for many, many times, and there's been new turns and new jobs and new things. Mm. But we've adapted. However, now I do think it's one of the issues as we think about civic engagement and the loss of trust mm. and the how that are trusted messengers are mm. some of the mm. most important mm. assets in yes. our communities That's that we have to protect. Okay. And as was shared earlier, they, they, it, these are our, could be our parents, could be our teachers, could be our professors, could be our community members, could be the, the, the youth, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think about, especially now, of how are some of our youth, when we take a look at the demographics of this country, the big shift mm -hmm. of um, going towards majority people of color, and when we take a look, uh, uh, look at wh what does the next generation look like, we have a, this new generation that is getting most of their information from TikTok. Mm -hmm. from YouTube, as we were discussing last night, mm -hmm. from different ways that they're also not um, without the proper civic engagement education yeah. in their school in K-12. We are at the moment where some of the trusted messengers in our communities mm -hmm. have become now these digital tools mm. that at the moment don't have a way to have actual real content moderation. Right. We, we support a lot of experts that are literally fighting day in and day out to help a lot of provide more transparency around how are these contents and mis and disinformation being combated. Mm. Because a lot of the youth that we want to empower and support and pr provide all these resources are also um, being targeted to be disengaged mm -hmm. in civic engagement. And when we think about what's the opportunity now, I would love to see more um, 
uh, resources and attention and empowerment towards local elections, mm. local roles, mm -hmm. starting in your city, starting right. in your county, before we think about also at the state, because as, as an example, out in East Oakland, there are a lot of great initiatives that we're looking to support. And there's also new models of governance right. and power dynamics that I think are really helping empower a lot of these stakeholders who usually are uh, brought in after the strategy has been decided. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in good Oakland energy, they're like, that's not gonna happen here. You say in the good Oakland. You're not talking to us, <laughs> this, is not, this is not happening. So I love that opportunity to just engage um, and, and build that trust at those very micro experiences. Because if we zoom out of the current state right now, we look at US, we think about just globally what's happening, the role of all these deep fake type of technologies that are being deployed, not just in the US, but across all the different, um, different elections at this moment, is really scary. Mm -hmm. It's really scary of how we are um, losing trust in the current mm -hmm. uh, systems and how right. to actually create the new system. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that um, this intersection is gonna be super critical and, mm -hmm. um, going back to our communities and really looking at how to build more locally and empowering them. And I love, would love to have more youth be part of these panels as well yeah. so we can True. bring but, in their voice. But you know, I'm, listen, <laughs> those who are newly 40, I mean, can still be young. Let me just say that. Me, yes, clap it up for the newly 40 year olds. We are still youth. Um, I just, ha, ha, ha. Um, I just want to say, just to add to what Lily shared about the youth, I'm, it's a long running joke for me and, and my family about what is, if you're not 65, then you are still young. Mm. But see, exactly. Um, but I think what I would like to see, going back to your initial question and building on what Lily shared, I would love transgender, not transgenerational learning spaces mm. Mm. on media disinformation on how do you build an algorithm i mean the work that stillman is doing with their cybersecurity clinic and breaking down concepts and training is could be a module within a larger like transgenerational learning space and let me just say this because i am a woman of history and i have to talk about it the freedom ride specifically into Mississippi with freedom schools is a great model to think about how do we democratize translation of this AI world mm -hmm. we're building. Mm -hmm. And so not only did you have people from Mississippi and you're educating them about their voting rights, but they had to learn how to read. Mm -hmm. And so it was both the political action moment, but also the basic right. needs and having any, any AI, let me tell y'all, Cause you know, Justin gonna let me write for Tech Policy Press. Shout out to Justin. <laughs> I know, right? I'm about to just always have something to say. Um, you, you don't come to me with your AI regulation agenda, progressive people that I love and love, and some of them fund me. Let me say that. If you're not talking about digital equity and you're not talking about transgenerational learning spaces, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because you won't have a movement. Right. Mm -hmm. Because I, I agree with Latanya last night. I wasn't, you know, I don't know if that was a space for me to be like, yes, Latanya. I don't know. I, I should have done it, right? <laughs> but we need a social movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any major democratic moment, whether here in the U.S. or international relations course I took, you know, globally was fueled by social movements. Mm. And so though we have to begin figuring out how to interweave that into this very technical privileged conversation we have in DC when really in order to make DC better or the Silicon Valley better, it is the local, and Lily does a lot of good work in the local that we need to push into. And so thinking about transgenerational learning spaces would be my, yeah. my solution. That's fantastic. It's interesting because I wanted to ask you all about some of the challenges, and you've already laid out so many that exist in terms of some of the ways people are getting information, some of the ways people are feeling like they don't necessarily have what um, tools they need to, to come forth and kind of be part of not just the, a discussion or a conversation, but actually the movement and the changes right. that, they, that they seek. Uh, and then the other piece where, as it relates to trust, right? Like so many of these changes that we seek to see uh, only move at the speed of trust, right? Mm -hmm. Like so it only be, can become something when we can get to a place where people feel like 
the system is not stacked against them, where they can feel like what they are trying to do, that things won't be obfuscated or, or, or turned the other way, or, or that there's somehow some kind of like setup. Uh, but I did want to ask, I want to be mindful of the time, <laughs> um, I did want to ask a question related to, when you think about, I'm not going to say underrepresented communities, I'm going to say actively marginalized mm -hmm. communities, mm -hmm. and you think about what it looks like for those communities to make the most of leveraging public interest technology in their best interest, what are some of the strategies or maybe most effective strategies to, to create the kind of inclusive tech ecosystem or just the inclusive larger community ecosystem that allows them to play, I won't even say more so than they could when the language or the currency of, of moving policy was different. Uh, but let's, let's be aspirational and say just more than ever before. Like what does it take for actively marginalized communities to get into, and we've talked a little bit about voting, and that's one way to kind of say show up in a civic engagement way, but there are plenty of other ways to show up to be involved in terms of civic engagement, what can we be leveraging that maybe we're not? Hmm. Or maybe, and I'll stop there because I can see you all thinking, <laughs> but maybe, <laughs> what maybe, it's not like a new fancy thing, but maybe that people may not be thinking of, right? So like, what is maybe old school that? Well, if I can go back to something you said originally and when you said your people, you know, yeah. and I think that's so huge because if all of us say our people and mm -hmm. it's got so many inter intersections. So depending on what day of the week you talk to me or in what environment, my people might be different. Mm. And so, I mean, I think that's one thing that we can all just start out is just saying when we talk about public interest technology, what's the community? What's mm. my people? How to make my people your people better and I think if we all have that focus then that's going to make the larger community better so we're not just looking you know and we realize hey we've got some similar peoples uh together and so I think that's really oh my gosh. really would help Kevin for president because I'm like when we get <laughs> to get our people to actually be we the people maybe we could get somewhere right well see I'm gonna go the opposite direction <laughs> and no and I Listen, love our people. I had a thought. <laughs> Just go with it. Imagine, I know that we protest corporations when they do bad things, right? We, right. Yes, y'all are cool with that. Shake your hands again. You may not agree with this, but just as a thought experiment, because we're all researchers and scholars in here, what would it look like to protest foundations for their lack of giving consistent funding, mm. oh, you see where I'm going, mm. um, to organizations locally who mm. really could make change. What would it look like to protest them? I know this is a thought experiment because we need their funding, but I'm beginning to think that philanthropy is part of the challenge mm. too. Not just our people, not just our collective people. It, it is easy to individualize behavior, but systems are maintained by systematic institutions. Mm. Government, we understand. Companies, we understand. But the missing piece of that conversation is how philanthropy, the progressive ones too, seed episodically into visions and then move to other visions. When white supremacy, systematic poverty is a consistent thing. So help me to understand, you want us to mobilize for public interest technology, to understand civic tech, to understand gov tech, but you do not fund black and brown organizations consistently or for HBCUs, you give them all the technicalities of technical assistance instead of just giving them the capital because you assume and look at them the way that you tell others should not look and assume about people that look like us. Mm -hmm. So 
So for me, my thing about it is how do we get public interest technology to the, give the capital, hold the philanthropic organizations accountable because those foundations came from companies who made their money on Extract. people that look like me. I know it's quiet and they, <laughs> and they fund me too. Mm -hmm. Don't worry. But see, this is why I have the substance of things not yet here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cause I have, I have, let me just say this. I have, I am thankful enough to have done enough work without the help of philanthropy to know that my life does not end when they decide to move on. Mm -hmm. But it is a political project to hold them accountable for their in and out moments. Everyone, all of they are all excited about AI, but I tell you yet again, you cannot have an AI future when the majority of Americans don't have internet. Mm -hmm. You are reifying an inequity. You are enshrining it with funding. Mm -hmm. So that would be I, the people for him, the system and the foundations for me. Mm -hmm. I think for me, it's really the ecosystem because there you go. A, 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 a lot of these pieces are interconnected, right? So to Fallon's point, I work in Philanthropy and I, I like K Four. They funded my first. Hey, <laughs> <Hi>, Frida. <laughs> but however, I, I do think as somebody who has has come from corporate mm -hmm. and engineering, all these different ro roles into coming in philanthropy, I think that also created a fresh perspective into right. mm -hmm. understanding that th this isn't philanthropy. These are investments. Mm -hmm. If we use the power of language right. and treat our community partners mm -hmm. and grand partners as investments right like we're investing in their work in their vision in their in in the impact that they're having and i think the challenge now especially as you bring up Fallon, the all these dollars and investments that are not just foundations but also venture capital right. dollars uh university endowment dollars that fund the vcs that fund the technologies right that then go ipo that then start their own dot orgs that then go and fund some of this work, right? They're all interconnected. And I think it's really critical, going back to what I shared earlier, for our awareness, for all the folks who may not be in these spaces mm. to understand the mapping of how some of yeah. these dollars run. So then that way we could also uh, have those points of understanding, this isn't right, we have right. to push back. Where's the transparency, where's the accountability? Um, and I do think that if we think about also who's managing our pension dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Where we think about how are some of our tax dollars also being allocated. Right. And so I do think it's all of those pieces that we need to look at it. And from the K Center perspective, this is why we look at it as an ecosystem, K through 12, computer science equity, tech pathways that are alternative, not just requiring uh, degrees, but looking at what are the, the, uh, the, the upskilling pathways, right? right. Um, looking at what's happening inside the tech companies, because we haven't touched upon the surveillance that's currently taking place in yeah. the workplace and the, yeah. gig con the gig workers and the economies and the rights that we have there, as well as looking at venture capital that is really fueling all of this. So mm. I would say it's, we have to make sure that we have a, an understanding of the ecosystem yeah. and then dive in into each specific uh, focus points for, for us yeah. to have actions and, and out outcomes. I got to tell you, I could sit up here all day and <laughs> chat with you all about this. Uh, this has been really um, edifying for me, but also just it's, it's been inspirational as well. So I have one last quick question that's, you know, you won't be surprised kind of call to action, right? What is it, I'm gonna ask each of you to just kind of say briefly kind of like what the one thing is, and here's my little qualifier for it. You've talked about uh, some of the systems, you've talked about the people, you've talked about ecosystems and the like. Um, I would like specifically to hone this into the kind of what I consider kind of the unusual suspects. Mm -hmm. So the everyday folks, right? The everyday people who don't have this as their day job, right? They're not thinking about these issues when they go and they do their work and then they come home and they maybe do their other work. But whatever their stuff is, this is not necessarily on their radar. But if we're talking about civic engagement and we're making that connection between public interest technology and civic engagement, we're talking a little bit about those people too, those unusual suspects who are the folks who could be engaging maybe in different ways or understanding something differently. So instead of your call to action being, which you have wonderfully, some of you already given a little bit of a call to action for some of these <laughs> other folks, if you think about that person, the person who I'm making up 
His name is Ned, and he's an architect. And uh, he helps people with their houses and their, and their uh, bathroom remodels. What should Ned be thinking differently in terms of your call to action for where he fits into public interest technology meets civic engagement? And finally, please be brief, because I would like to have um, our audience ask a few questions. So this isn't actually your official last word. I just knowing that you have power, you have individual power, your lived journey is your power. Um, and I think being able, especially now where we feel that we are pieces of the puzzle, mm -hmm. that feels like that we're losing control. I, I go back to the individual, your lived experience, your unique journey mm -hmm. in your voice is actually what we need now. Mm -hmm. We need more folks to stay engaged, to speak up, to ask questions, to say, what does it mean? What, is, what happens with this is the moment for um, those folks, and I would actually say that this, all of this, I hope it is uh, for all those folks who are maybe not in the room at the moment, but I, I, I do hope that they understand that you don't have, you don't need the technical degree. You, your own lived journey right now has helped, has immense insight. We wanna make sure the folks are staying mm -hmm. um, in tune with that power, because we need it, because it's gonna be a extremely difficult year and we want to make sure, at least for me personally, that we don't lose folks um, in, in, the, in the civic engagement, whether it's local elections, national elections. Um, I think it's just a time for folks who just feel that there's a community for them to be part of this larger power movement. Thank you for that, Lily. Yeah. I mean, and I, I guess what I would talk to Ned, the architect, um, <laughs> but to, to uh, talk about the questions, you know, to keep asking those questions. Because if you think about an architect, think about an architect, um, smart homes can mm -hmm. be looked at entirely different. Very good. From a cyber person, there's a lot of risk there, privacy surveillance. But at the same time, a smart home implementation can let somebody that's, you know, possibly might not be able to live on their own to be able to live independently for a longer period of time, you know. And so it's asking those questions, is this the right implementation? for this and not just look at it as one side or the other. Is it positive? Is it negative? It's mm -hmm. just, you know, the same technology might be recommended in one instance and not in another. So I think to kind of piggyback off of yours is just ask those questions. Hmm. I just co-signed both of them. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Fallon. <laughs> thank you all so very much. We'd love questions, please. There is a mic, I think, and Dreen has a mic. I have a mic. <laughs> if you have a question, just is it raise on? your hand, please. Come on now, this is a good oh, question. I see a question right one. here. <laughs> the lady in the black jacket. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, thank you for your panel. I appreciate all of your thought and work into it. I wanted to pick up a note from Fallon's keynote and that is of joy and pleasure. Um, mm -hmm. And I wanted to hear more about how that manifests in your work um, in imagining new worlds. And uh, Ruha Benjamin and others talk about when we're talking about epistemic red lines, mm -hmm. redlining, tech dystopia, it's, we're living in someone else's imagination. Mm. So I would love to hear more about your imagination and your joy. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, but that's, that's for. Is it for Alan? me? I mean, I was going to talk. Oh, go, go. No, go. And Lily, I'm, I got you. Go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think for me, honestly, the joy is in being able to be curious. Mm. I think that we have a lot of creativity in our community that um, I, I think of examples of how I'm seeing right now in, in certain parts in Oakland as well of artists starting to leverage uh, these different technologies for more expansive storytelling for capturing you know, their family's history and being able to share it out in augmented reality exhibits across the nation, mm -hmm. right? And shout out to Terminus AR, Damian McDuffie, who you should all support. <laughs> and we also have other uh, um, folks like Kai Fraser, who has uh, curated, created a uh, VR and AR company that is also helping share the history of civic, uh, civic engagement, civil rights, and being able to bring those experiences leveraging technology to students who their school districts are super underfunded. 
Mm. But yet with the creativity and imagination of something low cost, they're able to see different worlds, travel through time, really, mm. right? And so I think that's the type of innovation that really brings me joy and being able to uh, see the people who are specifically black women um, and are the black community as a Latina, right? For me to also be know how to be a good ally and how to create space and investment and, and support that. I think that also brings me joy of how I can be part of that work and also being able to help my own community be educated and um, be able to identify some of our own biases as well in the Latinx community. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of education, a lot of sh knowledge sharing, a lot of cultural, especially th seeing um, how we can all be in breaking bread together and mm. being able to share and li have shared experiences of family, of love and joy. And so mm. um, I think those types of examples bring me a way that we can help remove some of those barriers that physically exist into a way that we can imagine and create new things. So I think creativity, art, community, family, uh, ancestry, roots, I think are really um, important, especially now. Mm. I will simply say the conqueror gets to write the history. Mm. Um, we all, really, those who conquer get to tell you this was the beginning, the middle, the mm. end. Um, even though we know that there are concurrent stories happening in that same space. And so when I hear all the dystopic movies or the dyspo dystopic conversations about AI, I'm a bit of a cynic. Let me just say that to each of you. I am like, uh, this, is, this imagination comes from people who have never had to figure out where their next meal is going mm. to be. Mm. This imagination comes from people who have not had to toil with creating um, gumbo because they didn't have the best food because they, didn't, they can shop in certain parts of, of New Orleans, right? Th that imagination comes from people who have never had to share a home. Mm. Mm. And so for me, it is not a future. It is not a, that's not my future because I know what it means to have and not go cannibalize people. Mm. Mm. And, so, and, so, and so for me, that notion of, of, of fear mongering and what the future is gonna hold, it comes from people who have not done enough self reflections mm. on their own privilege. That's the first thing. Mm. The second thing I would say for me, and Andrine and I, once again, we have a lot of coming. We have fallouts too, but then we can go back together. No, this is, <laughs> this is friendship. It really is a true friendship. Um, and we've talked a lot about this. She and I are in the mindset that it is, the reason why I song, the reason why I talk about historical institutions, and the reason why I talk about black people, but I can also talk about any oppressed group of people in this globe, in this world, that their spiritual traditions mm. of freedom always, it's like their spiritual practices, whether it's Buddhism, whether it feeds them seeing themselves free. And I think part of the challenge for us in a highly technical world that we're beginning to build out, and also among scientists and scholars, empirical scholars, irrespective of a discipline, it's sometimes hard for us to think about the malleable squishiness of spirit, mm. which I think is joy, mm. which I think is faith. But sometimes if you give me really good, I think it's magic. It just depends <laughs> on where I am in this world. Um, and I think we have to, I do a lot of things. I keep telling you this. I am also a researcher. I know you think I'm a preacher, but I am a researcher. <laughs> um, and part of the work that Kevin and I do is try to operationalize joy in our index on building a black tech ecosystem. Mm. For me, it is the dreaming. I can, because systems, does, systems do not change over time. They take other systems to push them out. They take mm. social movements mm. quicker to move systems. And, but I tell people, when I tell you a score for your city and if it's able to create a thriving black tech ecosystem, People used to get upset with me and say, oh, you gave me an F for my city file. I said, well, you ain't cultivate the systems not to get an F. However, if you have black people doing any type of work of dreaming about a Wakanda, I will take that as an empirical point in my model and score it against, weighted score against the disparity of your city. Mm. 
Hmm. I know that's not scientifically true. One believes that a thought can change, but let me tell you, it has been the creative radical imagination of black people to envision freedom that made democracy real for everybody in this country. Do you see what I'm saying? It is the, the spiritual imaginative space that we as scholars and as practitioners need to build into our practice, into our scholarship, because it is the most consistent thread on how change actively happens. It is a thought. That is so powerful. That is so powerful. I appreciate it for that. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Maybe one more? I see a question right back here. Thanks. I'm, I'm hoping that maybe the three of you, four of you, will help me resolve what I come up against as a dilemma. I'm a, also not a technologist. I am a professor of English literature. And as much as I want to tell the incoming undergraduates that I see to go into the humanities, I know particularly for communities that are coming out of economically underdeveloped uh, areas that if they want to take a path to economic success and mobility, that they have to go the route of a STEM field mm -hmm. or that they might be best served by doing that. And so I'm wondering if we're talking definitionally about the future of Pitt and how we want to define Pitt how we resolve the idea that on the one hand we want humanistically minded people to go to tech companies and on the other hand the jobs that they will get if they go into tech companies will be the jobs that have the most precarity that tech companies will cut first and that perhaps they would be better served to take those humanistic ideals not as a major but perhaps in, into themselves and then take a STEM route. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if we're talking about the future of Pitt and the definition of Pitt how do you envision a kind of curriculum or a discipline that mm. blends these two things and how can we see a future for the next generation of technologists and humanists that brings them to places where they can be economically secure as well as effective? Mm. Well, that's a great question. Yes. Great question. I can share. Oh, well, I don't know if Kevin, you want to, because we've been speaking. <laughs> you know, we women of color going to talk. You better talk, brother. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, um, but I think one of the things, that's a good point, you know, because being um, economically secure is important for us all. And maybe it's a combination of curriculums as we kind of talk about. So if you're interested in going into, you know, a legal profession or a criminal justice profession, for instance, um, that the tech skills are important. I kind of, someone asked me recently, you know, where do I see cybersecurity in the future? And moving out of a individualized discipline into all of the other disciplines because it's going to be important no matter what field that you're in that you have these technology skills so mm -hmm. i think that's what we might see when we talk about public interest technology the technology piece becomes less as a standalone discipline and more of part of all of our disciplines mm. I would agree. As, as somebody who went through the traditional path of going through four-year engineering, I majored in electrical engineering, um, and I ended up going into software engineering, hardware engineering. And my first role, that what was interesting was the title that I had, multidiscipline engineer. Mm. <laughs> I was like, this is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what I didn't realize was that the, um, I was uh, working side by side, mechanical engineers, electrical, software. Um, at that time, computer science was under the, the arts, the language uh, school. Mm. So you had a mix of these humanities, right? And, but we were all, regardless of how you got in, you were a multidiscipline engineer. And the way that we um, were looking at our path was that we were going to become systems engineers. And so I think what right now, it's an interesting moment where it's not about one type of uh, skill. I think we all uh, have different interests and skills, and we're going to continue to become more multi-hyphenate. Is that the right mm -hmm. word? Yeah. Um, yeah. Where we need to have that set of multidisciplined uh, thought, but it's not just one person. It's a team, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's the important part. Um, and I think that, especially when I think about my own schooling back then, I wish I could have had more space in my program to take those humanity classes. Actually, my roommate back in undergrad, she was majoring in 
poli sci and I'm like oh my gosh like she's doing like human stuff like real world <laughs> stuff like what am I doing here working in this stuff this like it was this very disconnect mm -hmm. I, I think we have seen now much many more different um, approaches and models of students being able to also take create their multidisciplined background right that I think we're going to continue to see more um, so I, I share that example because I do think that there are a lot of different models out there. I think it's a matter of having folks also see themselves as multidisciplined, regardless of where you're coming. Somebody that could be a law person now is doing law in tech, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody who was doing civil rights now is doing digital civil rights and combating some of the mis and disinformation. So I think that there's this continuous upscaling and reskilling and understanding that we're going to see more of. Um, and at the Caper Center, we have a lot of different resources of how to pro bring in more justice-oriented computer science education, as an example. Not just for the students, but for the educators, for the parents, for the different types of stakeholders there that I think are, um, are really hungry for this type of multidisciplined approach. And so for me, I always say, we're all tech. We're already all tech. We've been tech for a long time. Now it's the part that it's really the moment for social scientists, more of these multidisciplined approaches that I think are really missing from the current state of technology. Mm -hmm. And I just would encourage more and more folks to just, um, you're already in it. And so we need you to participate and be part of building um, and also uh, pushing back on some of these, these technologies as well. I I would say just can I please please I would say I look at the data um, in particular for first generation black college students they major in low earning but socially impactful majors the data is true it hasn't changed in the last five years they're in human services right they are they in they in the, in the types of careers that that engenders is they are social workers they mm -hmm. on the high end of stem they would be nurses right and and so they're in human based fields when you look at the data some of the research that dr ebony mcgee has done and looking across various groups of students even when you like oversample for like black students in the sample and Latinx students, you realize that when they say, when they're in STEM fields, that they don't wanna be like the Mark Zuckerbergs, like white students, right? They want to make their communities better. Mm -hmm. And so Ebony has this concept called the social ethic of care when we think about technology futures. I'm just trying to start with the foundation of data, right? For me, I don't, I don't see a challenge. I am a social scientist. Sometimes I can even think about the methodologies of, the, of, of hermeneutics and various like religious traditions. I tell the story that in 2016, I went to Code for America. I was one of five black people at Code for America that year. And it was at the genesis of this public interest technology mm -hmm. moment where the, what they call the, going back to philanthropy, this is a philanthropy story. <laughs> I'm gonna write about it one day. Um, they're, they're called the Debt Game Partnership. And they had a workshop with Travis Moore of Tech Congress um, I think Lori from Ford was there. I'm just naming names. It's like this, never mind. I was gonna say a funny thing. It's like the Cat Williams moment I'm about to have up here, but no one caught it. Okay, well anyways, uh, you caught it though, good job. Um, anyway, I went to the workshop and they were talking about this concept of public interest technology. And at that time I was working at American Baptist College where um, Congressman John, Lewis when where they did the trainings for the sit-ins. I'm, I'm leveling a story here. Mm -hmm. So I go into this workshop, I hear about this, and I was like, ding, ding, ding. Oh my God, HBCU's students do this already. Mm. That was seven or eight years ago. Yeah. I said, oh my gosh, we, HBCUs can win. I said, Lori, before we give me some money to do this. <laughs> And she says, well, Fallon, we're at the precipice of this moment. We're not there yet, but I will connect you with the K-Poor Center in Oakland through Allison, which is, I've known, I've known K-Poor for like almost 10 years now. What I'm trying to say simply is, I don't, I've always said, even at the beginning of this moment of canonizing the term, 
that it was always about social justice and the mm. humanities. Because if I only relied specifically on the sciences to do this, then black and Latino students would not be included because they're not in the STEM majors. Did you hear what I said? If our definition, going back to the praxis of this moment, is based on technical skills, and this is the future that we want to build as pit, then you take me off the board. You take my children off the board. You take our community off the board because we're having to battle to be able to level set computer science for all in K through 12. Mm -hmm. So that when they come into your discipline or they come into your college, they are actually in those classes that they are retained mm -hmm. and have high attrition. I just want to be mindful. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry. So I'm, I'm done. I'm done. And, I'm uh, done. You did cut no? me off, though. I was, I was landing, <laughs> Go, go, go. Land, 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 land. So my landing is simply this. <laughs> Thank you. We, we all need to have a come to Jesus or Muhammad or whatever your spiritual practice is about what the definition and what the pathways mm. are. Because yet again, we'll have that type of dialectical uneasiness about should, what is a public interest technologist? Do they go into companies? Do they create their own space? And matter of fact, I'm probably at the end of it to say that they should create their own spaces, their own products and their own disciplines. Because at this moment, I don't see the current system supporting them. Mm. That's an excellent point. And I think that it ties in because you're asking what should the direction be for, for young folks who are trying to figure out what they should be doing. It looks like we have a few more questions, but I'm, fortunately I'm, I don't have uh, the time left for us to continue on with the questions. But I have so, so enjoyed this conversation. This has been fantastic. And I hope that you will follow up with anybody that you wanted to ask an additional question to uh, as soon as they step off. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.